Hi, everyone. It's 1.05, so we'll begin. I'm Charlie Kyle, the principal of Ennis College, and I'll begin by reading the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indig Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Well, it's my extreme pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, today's guest and host. Um, uh, those of you who were at our alumnus lecture of over a year ago will well remember Phil Howard from Oxford. And he will be speaking today, uh, primarily in relation to his book, Lying Machines. But I will leave the details of that to our moderator, uh, Darren Abramson. Darren is also an alumnus, as is Phil, of the college, and is currently an associate professor of philosophy at Dalhousie University. Darren has published original research in computer science and philosophy, and teaches in the computer science and arts faculties at Dalhousie. His current research applies supercomputing resources made available by Compute Canada to the construction of reproducible natural language models. His past research defends the hypothesis that machines can think against mathematical and philosophical criticisms of that claim, and also shows that Turing got the idea for the Turing test from Descartes. So I'd say take that. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn the stage to Darren Abrams. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Phil Howard. Uh, he's a professor and a writer. He teaches at the University of Oxford and directs the Oxford Internet Institute. He writes about information politics and international affairs, and he is the author of 10 books, including The Managed Citizen, Pax Technica, and Computational Propaganda. He has won multiple Best Book Awards, and his research and commentary writing has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, and many other international media outlets. Foreign Policy Magazine named him a Global Thinker for 2018, and the National Democratic Institute awarded him their Democracy Prize for pioneering the social science of fake news. He has testified before the US Senate, UK House of Parliament, and European Commission on the causes and consequences of fake news and misinformation. His latest book is Lie Machines, How to Save Democracy from Troll Armies, Deceitful Robots, Junk News Operations, and Political Operatives. He, blogged, he blogs at www.philhoward.org and tweets from at pnhoward. And so just to give you all a little uh, sense of how things are gonna go, uh, uh, Phil's going to take us through about uh, 25 minutes of discussion about his new book. Uh, we'll have, me and him will have a short conversation and then we'll open it to the floor for questions from the attendees. So without further ado, Phil Howard. Hi. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Charlie, for those kind words uh, and for this opportunity to, to present. It's a particular honor to present to you uh, all because I actually aired some of this material, the very first seed stages of this project uh, in the town hall about a year ago and got a lot of good feedback and a lot of tough questions from the audience, questions that helped me shape the project in a significant way. So I'm gonna start the process of screen sharing and go through a presentation. The goal uh, for my presentation really is to give you a taste of what's in the book, um, get you excited about it, uh, and uh, talk about some of the things that have changed because so much has changed uh, in the last six months since the book really went to bed. Uh, and then we'll have our, our good conversations about the latest trends. I wanna offer a discount code that um, I got from the press for uh, our uh, illustrious NS alums. If you're still interested in this topic by the time you finished, uh, finished uh, by the time the webinar is finished, um, you can use Why Lies at uh, the Yale University Press website uh, to get 30% off, off the book. Um, and I'm happy to put the code up again at the very end, um, as I said, if you're still interested in it uh, by, the, 
um, by the end of the hour. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about what the Oxford Internet Institute is and what our team does. Um, then I'm going to talk about what a lie machine is, what its components are. I'll go through some of the evidence that we play that I play with in the book, and then uh, talk about what's changing. Um, I hope during the Q&A and perhaps in the last few moments of the presentation, I can hit on the strategies for battling lie machines, because I don't think it's too late uh, to restore some good behavior to public life. And uh, I think there are things we can do to improve the quality of public discourse. So most of the stories uh, that you'll see in this book come from research I did as director of the Computational Propaganda Project. Uh, this is a team of about a dozen students, postdocs, early career researchers. The Oxford Internet Institute as a whole is actually a fairly large department in the social sciences division. Uh, we've got about a third computer scientists, a third social scientists, a third humanists, and our computer scientists have to learn the theory and our social scientists have to learn to code or at least to learn the craft of code. And our, our philosophers, our humanists, give us the big picture questions that sort of drive us forward uh, into studying problems like fake news and misinformation. As I said, my own team is about uh, a dozen people, uh, doctoral students, early career researchers, each who specialize in different parts of the world. And the research itself has been supported by the National Science Foundation in the States and the European Research Council in, in Europe. Most of the public science agencies um, won't always do uh, public outreach work. And so the Yomidiar Foundation helps us do the civil society engagement, the public outreach work that, that's an important part of our research these days. So what is a lie machine? When I refer to a lie machine, I refer to the social and the technical mechanism uh, for putting a fib into the service of an ideology. And, and the two parts there, the social and the technical, are both equally important. I think it no longer makes sense to talk about politics uh, without making room for the social organization that uh, represents, that helps a politician win or that enforces social control, and the technical system, the, the algorithms that manage the delivery of social media content, that, that prioritize stories for your social media feed, or that prioritize which news stories you might encounter in a given news market. These two things combined, the social and the technical, are what produce the contemporary political environment for us. As I said, it doesn't make sense in my mind to talk about modern politics without making room, without giving some room in the narrative for both the social and the technical. Now, what I would argue is that there's a social and a technical side to the production of lies, the production of misinformation. It's mostly a technical system behind the distribution of political lies, right? These are the algorithms in social media that deliver content to you, to your inbox. There's a social side to it in the sense that um, there are firms like Facebook and Twitter uh, that profit enormously by distributing political lies. Um, but for the most part, the distribution part of things is, is algorithmic. It's, it's difficult to understand how it actually affects our behavior and our attitudes and our aspirations. The third part of this is a marketing system. It's almost like an aftermarket of organizations that take a fib, take a news story that isn't quite, um, isn't full of truths or has doctored images and makes the news story have a long life, uh, something that can last for months or years. Those are the three stages of producing a political lie. And now I've got some examples of um, what they look like and sort of how they, how they work. This is a screen capture from one of my um, favorite, most recent awful lies that we're studying. Um, it is the, an incredibly complex, um, an incredibly complex nonsensical narrative that connects um, conspiracy theories around 5G cell phone towers with a cult of personality around Bill Gates with a, a fairly old, uh, a long-standing anti-vaccination campaign meme about how the government is trying to put RFID chips into our blood, into our arms, uh, all tied together with COVID um, and the current COVID public health crisis. It is an incredibly complex narrative that involves multiple different kinds of ele uh, elements, but at its core, 
is about a conspiracy and revealing a hidden truth and uh, digging deep into some story that you didn't know is, um, is behind the big, the big powers that manipulate our lives. Now, as a package, it's full of misinformation. Uh, there's very little that's accurate um, or true in any part of the, the, the misinformation around COVID conspiracy. Let me go into a little bit about how the lab works, how we get our data and how we play with it. This is an example from the 2016 election in the US. We spent a significant amount of time studying uh, what went on with Hillary versus Donald. This was one of the accounts we tracked. Uh, the bear might give it away, uh, but it's an example of a Russian account that would mostly work in English, although occasionally it would tweet in Cyrillic and then it would go back to working in English. Uh, and this is an account at the time, it had uh, a wildly divergent ratio of followers to following. Uh, it worked on soap opera, soap opera stories and sports scores for, for a long time until suddenly it started um, working in English on, uh, on Trump and the election. When we start a new scoop, a fresh scoop of social media data, we often start with Trump's follower list, especially if we're studying Twitter. I don't mean that as a political jab, uh, I mean that as a methodology point. He has so many uh, bots following him, and uh, these are accounts that um, never generate content, never, don't have pictures, uh, use numbers and letter combinations for names. These are, these are accounts that generate no traffic. And when we need a scoop of them, we tend to start with Trump's follower list. The reason these bots are problematic, it's, it's not the fact that they exist that, that makes it tough on public life. It's when they wake up and spew misinformation about um, Muslim women storming the Spanish beaches or um, Moroccans breaking through passport control into Spain, both, both doctored images, things that didn't happen, um, but both news stories that garnered quite a bit of circulation on social media. At this point, we've studied 40 different countries around the world, and we tend to work in a very multi-method way. Uh, the best social science now involves a little bit of qualitative work, a little bit of quantitative work, and something computational. Uh, so today, we do field work with the bots, the people who design troll, and the people who run the troll-based campaigns, and then we do the computational work. Um, we have been working on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp. Increasingly, we need to tool up for the next US election uh, to do Instagram and Tinder. I have a Tinder story I could tell at the end if you like. Um, TikTok, YouTube, and WhatsApp are the platforms we need to be able to study next. Now, let me give you a taste of the kinds of data that we played with in working on the, the story to tell around the 2016 election. As you may remember, in um, 2017, the US Senate called the heads of the major social media firms to, to Congress to testify. And as part of that process, the major firms turned over large volumes of data. Uh, this was data on the only accounts that they've, the firms have ever verified as being managed from St. Petersburg. These were accounts that were started in Russia, uh, managed there, and became active political accounts during the US election. Now, the first figure I have for you here is a simple chart of daily activity. And the punchline is straightforward. Uh, the Russian backed accounts bloomed, their activity bloomed on the nights in which there was major political activity. So if there's a major event in the electoral calendar, that's when the Russian backed accounts woke up. Um, the night of the DNC and the RNC, national conventions. Uh, when Clinton and Trump had their national debates. That's when the activity rose. Uh, election night, that's when the activity rose. And then the weekend after the election, that's when the bot writers, uh, the trolls went home. They took the long weekend off. Now the other interesting thing about this graphic is that the bulk of the Russian activity we know about from these three and a half thousand accounts occurred after the 2016 election. It's later into 2017 and even into 2018. It's almost as if the foreign, um, the internet research agency uh, doubled down or hired more staff or decided that they had had an impact and wanted to do more work. So Russian activity peaks whenever there's a major uh, political event. The bulk of the activity has happened since that election. It wasn't, that election itself wasn't the peak. 
I mentioned earlier that there were multiple different kinds of data. There was um, YouTube search data that they provided us. Um, there was Facebook ads and Instagram posts that they provided to us. I put up this chart, I just highlight these two lines, to show that overall, Facebook ads are, were not a significant component of the Russian campaign. Um, I, think, I think the industry, the technology industry, would like us to stay focused on the ads, but I think that the major impact is on organic content. It's the stuff designed by humans, the humans behind these fake profiles. And a significant amount of content has actually moved from being produced on Facebook to being produced on Instagram. Now, this is a problem because Facebook rarely shares data and doesn't share it very well, and Instagram never shares data. So we know that Russian activity has moved on to Instagram, but we have even less sight of it, even less of it is shared uh, with researchers and independent journalists. Topically, there were three coherent domains of activity. Um, all this stuff is about polarizing the electorate, right? It's about picking on issues that are going to make people angry. In the US context, it's African-American history, African-American identity. A good portion of the messaging here was about discouraging African-Americans from voting. Um, if you're African-American, no white politician will ever represent you well, boycott the election. Um, don't bother to vote. Or um, if you're African-American, you can now vote by text message, which is, was not a thing. Or, or voting has moved, it's on Friday instead of Tuesday. All, all, thing, all messages designed to interfere with the, the process of electing a president. The other hot button issues, of course, in the US context are involved gun rights and abortion. More recently, the kinds of cultural messaging we saw around African, um, African American identity has moved into Hispanic, Latino, uh, Mexican American identity issues. And I think if I were to speculate for 2020, I think that's, that it'll stay focused on, on culture. It may even return in a significant way to Black Lives Matter given uh, the murder of George Floyd and what's going on, um, going on now in the US. Let me say a little bit about the global context for all this now. After doing that work for the US Senate uh, to prepare them for their interviews with CEOs, we decided to look around the world to see how many countries had these kinds of organized info ops, we call them information operations. In 2017, we counted 28 countries where there was um, clear evidence of um, political parties or military units in authoritarian regimes that had been retasked to produce misinformation. In 2018, we did the same inventory. The number went up again. And in 2019, the number went up quite significantly. We're doing the, the inventory again this summer. We don't expect the number to go down, right? And these are these are formal organizations. These are not lone wolf operations. These are organizations with um, receptionists and employment ads and performance bonuses and retirement plans. And these are formal in the sociological sense. They have hierarchies and bosses. Uh, like I said, they're not lone. This isn't a story about lone hackers. One of the things that's changed over time is that there are now multiple governments with little internet research agencies, little organizations that have copied the Russian mode of organizing this way. Uh, Venezuela, India, Iran, Pakistan, um, and Saudi Arabia have all emulated the Russian government. Uh, in fact, we've even noticed stories of training operations where staff will go to Moscow to be trained on how to do electoral interference and electoral misinformation. Um, BuzzFeed has also generated a significant amount of research into how this kind of troll-based campaigning now happens in the regular PR industry. It's, it's part of the commercial offer now for political communications consultants. A growing numbers of number of stories of, of information operations are not actually attributed to the Russian government anymore. They're attributed to firms, local firms, national firms that specialize in um, public perception. Now, I want to say a little bit about our, our junk, junk COVID news research. Each week, um, we at Oxford have been doing a, um, a Monday briefing about the misinformation uh, around COVID. 
And one of the things we've noticed is that in a significant way, China and Russia um, can generate more coverage for their misinformation about COVID uh, causes and consequences than even the best stories from the BBC or CNN or Guardian. So another way of saying this is that the, the junk news produced by state media agencies, Russia Today, CGTN, can sometimes reach as many as a billion social media user accounts. Now, we got that number by adding up all the Reddit users, all the Twitter users, all the Facebook users that follow these major news organizations. We know the state-backed number is probably, is, we know it's exaggerated because there are a lot of fake accounts that those governments themselves set up to follow their own news agencies. But it does give you a, a sense of how, com how comparable the footprint is, right? Um, the state-backed news, news agencies can reach a significant audience globally. Now, as I wrap up this, I wanna say, this part I wanna say a little bit about, I think the, the long-term trends that um, we need to worry about. I think going forward, it's safe to say that in most countries, um, every, national security crisis, every budget bill, every tax bill, every complex humanitarian disaster, every school shooting, every national crisis will come with some kind of automated and troll-based campaign for it or against it or uh, blaming political Islam, or blaming immigrants. Uh, it's, it's going to be a part of every domestic crisis issue going forward. I think for the first few years of doing this work and the first store chapters in the book, Lie Machines, are about the Russian government. In the last six to nine months, we've really seen China arrive as an information superpower. For many years, we thought they had capacity to produce misinformation, um, but they didn't seem interested in what English language social media users were, were doing, thinking about, saying about China. That really changed uh, during the Hong Kong protests, about nine, starting about nine months ago. And then it, it changed again, it became even more significant for the Chinese government during uh, the beginning of the COVID crisis. So China has really arrived. They now work across multiple social media platforms in English, and they operate communications campaigns on platforms that are illegal in their own countries. So they, they operate on, uh, they're definitely targeting voters in the West, uh, public opinion in the West, because uh, their own citizens can't use the platforms that they contribute to. I think more and more we're gonna see these, these campaign techniques normalized and used for regular lobbying, special issue lobbying. I don't believe we've seen artificial intelligence behind any of the messaging so far, but I would say that's on the horizon. If a, if a campaign consultant can take some of your behavioral data and some of your social media data and produce a, a face that you'll respond to or a, a deep authoritative voice that you'll respond to, they'll, they'll sink the money into figuring out how to do it well. And the big money investments in political communication are always the US presidential election. Now, I think the deep existential threat to democracy is actually about undermining the role of science in public life. There's many definitions of um, Politics, I got my favorite from um, the politics, intro to politics at the U of T. Um, there, the simple definition we played with was that politics is what happens when one person tries to represent another person. And very much ma many of the misinformation campaigns that we've seen are about getting us to choose politicians who go with their gut on key issues and question the science or, or question the policymakers, question the technocrats as if there's a conspiracy. And what happens is that if we choose those politicians, the politicians who don't believe in evidence, um, they tend to make poor decisions, lower the quality of life for citizens who then get more desperate and even more convinced that there's a conspiracy, a political conspiracy against them. So I am worried about this kind of cycle of degradation in public life. And um, let me end with a few thoughts of strategy on how we can use social data science to improve public life. Um, universities are, are definitely part of this role, right? Here's a domain in which I think social research actually is quite significant because um, it's, it's, the, it's the way we catch the lies and it's the way we promote truths. 
Now, I'll just offer um, the first of these ideas because there's a sequence um, that I go into in chapter five of the book. Um, the first idea for how to improve things is something I actually borrowed from the Blood Diamonds campaign. Um, and those of you may remember, this was a campaign to try to teach consumers that uh, teach consumers where their diamonds, the diamonds on the market came from. And the thinking was that if a consumer could know that a diamond came from the nastiest pits of Africa, um, they would not choose those diamonds. They would choose diamonds that were ethically sourced. So um, the core concept for changing, renovating the system here is that I think we should be able to look at any one of our devices and ask it to tell us who benefits from the data that it is collecting. Right now, devices can't do that, but I should be able to go to my smart TV. If I don't have a smart refrigerator, but if I did, I would want it to tell me which lobbyists are using information about the products I put in my refrigerator. I think that's going to be a basic entry level feature of a modern democracy if if we want that democracy to be representative of our values. Now, from there, if we can get a piece of technology to tell us who's benefiting from the data, I think we should be able to then add groups to the list of beneficiaries, hold them accountable in some way, um, maybe even figure out how to donate some of that data to public researchers. My thinking here is straightforward. The best data on public life and the quality of public life is not in public hands. It's not in the National Library of Congress. It's not in the National Library of Canada. It's not in the Library of Congress. It's not in the British Library. It's in Silicon Valley. It's in private hands. And the thing we need to do to resuscitate democracy is to divert the flow of data to create a public source of data. So I want to end with this upbeat, upbeat note and uh, with a declaration of faith. Uh, it can be pretty challenging to study misinformation and this, this really dark side of politics. Um, but I do think it's worth it. Um, it's worth restoring the faith and trust in democracy. I'm sorry, Jeannie, your answer was correct, but Kevin shouted his incorrect answer over yours, so he gets the points. That's, that's not the political system I, I want to live in. I, I would much rather live in one in which the truths went out um, and we talk about evidence-based policymaking. So thanks for listening. I'm eager to take your questions and have some feedback, and of course, uh, to chat with Darren. So I'll stop my screen share and we can come together for a group conversation. Hi. Wow, thank you for that presentation. That was excellent. Uh, I just want to quickly do one housekeeping thing. So uh, I've been asked to remind everyone who's tuned in that if they stick around to the Q, uh, to the end of the Q&A, we'll be giving three copies of this uh, incredible book uh, randomly to people who are still here at around uh, I guess it'll be around two o'clock Eastern time when we're all wrapped up. So stick around to the end and I, uh, and you can get a chance at a free copy of Why Machines. Uh, I made a few notes when I was reading your book, uh, Phil, and I, I have to say the first, I felt like it, for me, it had sort of two broad parts. The first half really opened my eyes to bad behavior that I was, inc that I, f I found incredible that it's in plain view. And so because of uh, the stories that you tell, the, uh, the, 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 this precious data that you got from the Senate Intelligence uh, Committee, I, I was sort of uh, bewildered at these things happening that we know about. And of course, it immediately calls to mind what is happening that we don't know about. And, uh, and then, as your final chapter makes clear, what we can do about it. Uh, and I guess my comments are, and my first question is really about what do we do about all this? Uh, I, I, do, I don't know if you're aware, Sasha Baron Cohen is this comedian who has all mm -hmm. these personas and he goes to events and yeah. tries to show our worst natures. Uh, he gave, uh, uh, he received the person of the year award from the uh, Anti-Defamation League in late 2019. And he gave a speech about the evils of Facebook. And to my great surprise, he advocated for uh, revoking section 230 of the Communications Decency Act in the United States, which uh, has been called the 26 words that created the internet. Uh, it provides kind of a blanket immunity uh, for these, you know, uh, sellers and distributors of fake news uh, from being called out or, or hurt with liability for these actions. But, and then to my incredible surprise, we just saw uh, President Trump 
advocating for the same thing uh, just about a month ago. So uh, because this is a live issue, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about this. Uh, does the internet need to be fixed in a legal sense uh, along these lines? I think, I think that may be one of the few ways to fix it. Um, I do agree that the social media firms should be accountable for the content that they publish. I do think of them as publishers. Um, Trump's reason for landing on this is totally different from what um, other you know, commentators, um, how other commentators have, have landed on it. Um, but I do think that the, the prox, you know, the, the deep, the, the long-term causes of the problem are, um, involve um, you know, our sophistication with news, the, the big crisis in the news industry, they need a new profit model. There's a lot of big picture, long-term trends. The proximate cause of um, misinformation and, and these political surprises is that Facebook serves up misinformation in the two or three days to voters, j just as they're making their decisions. And politi political scientists tell us that most voters don't actually make up their mind until two or three days before they vote. I mean, we may tell pollsters one thing or we tell our relatives something, um, but we usually don't decide until those days when we're actually thinking about politics. And that's when the junk is served up. So the solution to this has to involve um, some fix, change in the incentives right, for social media firms and um, some institutional change. Um, in, in another, you know, as looking navel gazing kind of way, um, I think higher education has failed in some ways to teach critical thinking skills because the, um, you know, when, when some political leaders gener who gener like Trump who generate misinformation, um, they will say they're doing critical thinking, but that's not the critical thinking that, <laughs> that's not critical thinking uh, to create conspiracies and then advance them to push them around. Uh, so the, you know, in a sense, this is also about media, media literacy too. Yeah, that, it's funny, the media literacy point, uh, I'm just looking at the Q&A and someone's already asked a question that was on my list, which is about uh, training ourselves to better cope with the this, this misinformation that we see. And you had a very interesting prescription late in the book on how we could, so, and you mentioned it in your presentation, so mandatory reporting on the ultimate beneficiaries of data. Now, I, so I love this idea, but I happened to watch this movie on Netflix about the Panama Papers. Uh, it was fictionalized, so hard to know how much of it is true. But I, I, I suppose the following question occurred to me as I was reading, given how little we know about the financial beneficiaries of everything, uh, it, w could you maybe say a little bit about the context, uh, that sort of context for your prescription about beneficiaries of data? Sure, sure. And I would love your help in answering your own question, because I think in part it's a, in part it's a um, might be a distributed ledger kind of problem, uh, or it, there might be a computational solution. I think we get these, um, you know, we get this incredibly detailed terms of service agreements that nobody reads and uh, that, that they still, that um, apps and technologies still come with, and we still use them because we want the service. But I think it would be a, a, I think it should be possible to create an overlay on a device that would look to see where data is being sent and expect manufacturers to record what third parties uh, have, have access to data and to return that list to the user who's paid for the device. So one of the, the problem with these terms of service agreements is, is that they always say, oh, we, we won't share your data with anybody except third parties that we, we agree to share the data with, right? And then there's a long list of third parties that you don't, you don't see. They change month to month. They have, um, it, it, so the instinct of your, your question is right. It's a complex industry um, of, of data miners. But um, without some policy, some policy oversight, we'll never get a, it's a, it'll remain a rat's nest. We'll never understand how it's structured or, or who's, who's getting all this value. Yeah, very good point. Uh, so back, you know, at least a generation ago, one of the kind of simple slogans that I remember hearing about how to cope with uh, junk on the internet and people who tried to rile you up 
was this old expression, don't feed the trolls. <laughs> I'm sure you remember this one also. And I find you, you, your last answer so interesting because the problem is that it's not us that's feeding the trolls. It's this third party that Facebook somehow benefits from the trolls because they rile us up. They get us to want to feel the satisfaction of some moral victory. So we're now kind of primed to do more engagement, which is what they want because then they sell more ads. And so uh, do you think that it's even possible, given the evidence that you marshal in your book, uh, for a kind of individual prescription? So saying to the, the individual, it's your job to distinguish correct stuff from incorrect stuff. Do you think we can survive in modern Western democracies without a change in policy? I think we, we definitely need a change of policy, um, but there are, and there are a few things that we can do as individuals that would totally help, right? Um, we shouldn't forward stuff that we haven't ourselves read. Right? When you get stuff that looks um, provocative, don't share it right away, read it and then share it. Um, there's a bunch of, and there's a good question from Zoe here on, on how to be mindful about news we consume. I think um, being a modern citizen, involves uh, having your news, having your favorite news sources, but then having one that's from a perspective you don't normally subscribe to. So if you're a liberal, have one conservative outlet in your, in your news diet. And if you're a conservative, have one liberal news, diet, news outlet in your diet. Because maintaining some diversity um, is actually in, in your news sources is part of your responsibility as a citizen. So um, not sharing stuff that we haven't ourselves checked out and um, being open to new information. Right? Those are, those are individual, um, individual responsibilities that we can take on. Great. Uh, so just on that note, Facebook gave some amount of data to the Senate committee on, the, on their judgment that these accounts were illegitimate in the sense that they were really employees of this internet research agency, uh, but appeared to be people from the little towns and communities uh, that they were sharing uh, misinformation with. So I guess my question is, Facebook know, if, let me put it conditionally, if Facebook knows uh, which accounts are, I don't know, reputable and which ones are fake, should they be telling us that in real time? And if they don't, can you speculate, given that you've seen all this data, how we can use our own kind of information landscape to make better judgments about whether mm. a person is real or fake? Great question. I think the, um, so let me answer a couple of ways. Um, in terms of our own individual habits, uh, don't forward things we haven't read. Um, another thing we can do is have a, have a scan back over our follower lists and the people we're following and take out people we don't recognize, right? We've all got people in our social network applications whom we don't actually remember, we don't really know. Um, if, there's, if there's somebody suspicious or somebody who's generating content um, that you think is designed to torment somebody, um, unfollow them, unfriend them, and, and or block them as, as you need to. Or flag for the social media platforms. Now flagging, um, until COVID, I think flagging didn't really didn't always work. The social media firms would say, oh, we have to protect all the users, just flag it if you don't know it, uh, if you don't know, uh, if you think something suspicious. But it wasn't clear that they would always act. And I think in fairness to the social media firms, it is very difficult to, to identify inauthentic activity in real time. Right? There's, there's a lot of corollaries, there's a lot of um, um, sophisticated modeling you can do to, to estimate the probability that somebody is um, and you know, in 2016, they should have been able to do this more. These were accounts, thousands and thousands of accounts that were clearly set up from in St. Petersburg months before the election. That's how Facebook knows. Um, they can, in theory, still tell which accounts are um, pretending to be Americans but are managed from Beijing. They, they can tell those accounts. I, I think they do collaborate. They collaborate well with the National Security Services in the US. I don't believe, I don't know that they collaborate particularly well with the Canadian government. Um, but, uh, you know, some combination of the firms doing more due diligence and us flagging the content for, for, um, for extra scrutiny, that's probably part of the solution. 
Uh, speaking of solutions, and uh, this is my last comment before I uh, start going deeper into the uh, audience Q&A. Uh, so I uh, once read a book by uh, Tim Wu on uh, the effect that advertisement has on media. And so he tells a story about the very first newspapers in the country that you now reside in, which uh, simultaneously realized that if they just printed the most outlandish stuff they could find or make up, along with uh, advertisements, they could make much, much more money than a rival newspaper that tried to support itself through subscriptions and then uh, just print the n news that was fit for print. In Canada, we've had a debate about whether the, our, our national broadcaster should go advertisement free. And I, I just wonder, do you have a perspective on whether and how the problems that we face are because of advertising supported media? I feel this is a very innocent question to ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the extent to which maybe in addition to building public stores of digital information, we might even build rival public social networks which don't have this profit motive in terms of uh, presenting information to us. Interesting. There's a lot of layers there. I'd say that um, in our research, in our comparative international research, one of the things that seems to inoculate a country against misinformation is having a national broadcaster. And, and I don't mean that the government owns the media, like in an authoritarian state. I mean, there's an entity like the CBC or BBC, uh, Israel, France, there's multiple countries that have a publicly funded, public interest news organization. And it, it's only partly that the, that organization cre generates professional news. It's that that, the, that national broadcaster creates a culture of professional news that has spin-off effects for all the other news organizations. So. Um, the CBC is among the most important things protecting Canada from misinformation. It's, it's hard not to overemphasize that. On the question of whether it has advertising dollars behind it, I would say if, if, the advertising, if advertising is removed and it's, it remains well-funded, that sounds fine. I think one of the challenges is that sometimes plans to tweak a national broadcaster system um, not national broadcaster system are really just about defunding. Um, so I wouldn't support a change that resulted in defunding, but significant resources. Now, I love your Tim Wu story. I want to add one historical addendum before we start taking questions. Um, the other funny, one other funny story from that period of, of news history is that the news organizations, the, those early print journalists also figured out that they could lie about their advertising numbers to each other and charge higher rates to advertisers. So they would say, well, we sold 10,000 papers and so our rate is this. And another news agency would say, well, we sold 20,000 and we charge this and, and those were lies. So the industry itself realized that they were just cheating themselves out of, um, that, that this was not gonna be good for the industry. And they actually collaborated, formed a consortium where they agreed to not lie, not make up their uh, advertise their sales numbers, uh, and so they did manage to coordinate in a s significant way. I wonder if we're at a similar moment now in social media, where the social media firms really do need to um, together work to battle this problem to help elevate the whole system. Very interesting. I'm scanning through questions. There's tons of great stuff coming yeah. in, and I see that we've already. Uh, touched on things. So Shirley was asking about diversity in our news sources. We've talked a little bit about the evidence that you produce in the book for what might distinguish better and worse political environments in terms of their ability to cope with fake news. Uh, I'm looking through other uh, questions. Uh, how does Canada compare, asks Barbara, in terms of uh, our efforts to combat fake news, but also distribute fake news? Okay, I'll tackle the last part of that first. Canada has one of the most important fake news sources. Um, and I'm gonna embarrass myself by, by misremembering the name. Uh, it's it's uh, basically a, a one guy in Montreal. It's called the Center for Global Research or something. It is not, it is not a tied to a university. It's not, <clears throat> it, it's, not a, it's a self-funded project. 
Um, but before, before Breitbart, um, there was this Center for Global Research in Montreal, um, and it's, it generates a significant volume of conspiracy theories, misinformation, sensational stories, uh, racist and sexist content. And so, um, it, and it's not, it's not particularly about Canada, it's got a global audience, it just happens to be based in Montreal. So there is, there is locally produced stuff. Um, unfortunately, um, I think the storyline of having this stuff originate from the Russian government has changed a little bit now. A significant amount of um, conspiracy content comes from white supremacists in country. Uh, so the, the not conservatives, ultra conservatives, uh, extremists far right in Canada, white supremacists in Canada um, are, are a worrying source of misinformation. Um, now on the good side, uh, I mentioned earlier that the CBC is one of the things that inoculates the country as a whole. Um, Facebook has been barely responsive to the US government and they've just been a little bit less, you know, a little bit less responsive to the Canadian government and then not very responsive to many other democracies. So I do think that Canada has punched above its weight compared to other parliamentary democracies in the sense of getting concessions, getting ad archives, getting Facebook to do some creative things, uh, some creative things in Canada. Yeah, I seem to remember our pri uh, former privacy commissioner extracting concessions from Facebook in uh, elections past in Canada. Uh, yeah. The details escape me right now. Uh, Linda asks, I think, a very simple but important question. Uh, in terms of teaching children about the constant attack that we're under on social media, do you have thoughts? I mean, yeah, I, I found your book very readable, uh, maybe above an elementary school reading mm -hmm. level, but you know, still very enjoyable. Uh, how should, do you have any thoughts on how we should uh, uh, be packaging and informing and maybe educating young people about the incredible challenges that you identify? Well, um, the modern civics program, modern civics program needs to include some social media literacy um, aspects. I think the research on how kids process news is um, that there's not a lot of research. The research suggests that um, kids are, are um, consuming less long form news, but are actually consuming, are, are, get, are getting more exposure to news because they use mobile phones and they tend to use devices that will let them quickly swipe through headings. So it's probably a myth to say that kids these days aren't getting the same news that we, we old folks get out of print. They're just getting it in a slightly different way. They're, they're getting the, the 200 word increments um, or less, um, but they're exposed to it much more when they're standing at the bus, when they're on the bus, when they're walking off the bus, right? Because they're constantly on their phone and that, and that feed is, is part of what they get. Um, I'd say, I'd say this, these basic things of not sharing stuff you haven't verified, um, that, that's valuable too. I think that try encouraging kids to have a few platforms that they play with, but to go cautiously into new platforms that have affordances adults don't fully understand. And one of the long standing bits of advice has, has been that parents should be where their kids are. So if, if, when they have their devices, if they're on a platform, um, you should be linked up with them so that you get a sense, so that you learn what the app is doing uh, with their information. I think that's, the, that's very concrete and helpful. And uh, I think that your book does a really effective job of uh, giving a sort of data-based picture. So folks who have uh, children on gadgets might not, before they read your book, under, have understood uh, you know, we, there's all kinds of concerns, you know, bullying and other things that we've heard a lot about in terms of uh, bad behavior online. But the notion that at any moment, some political actor from far away might be incentivized to put content on me solely to manipulate me and my network. Uh, I, that, that I think is, it's a new, I'm sorry to say for the parents out there, an, a new concern that, uh, that I, I, I wasn't aware of, or I, I wasn't aware of the scale of be, uh, before reading your book. Uh, and so I, we've touched on all kinds of stuff from the Q and A. I'm just, uh, uh, there's, reading there's through. One question from, there's one question from Mark about tax policy. Um, can I tackle that one? Cause it's, I think there's two kinds of things we could do, right? There's content moderation. And I don't think many of us would want the government to do content moderation 
um, during uh, on social media platforms. That's probably least interesting. The other bucket of, act, of, of a bucket of activities is um, related to finance and tax, right? Financial inducements, and, and I think figuring out a way for to divert some of the revenue that um, major social media platforms have extracted from independent journalists, di diverting that back into um, journalism is is going to be very important for public life. So just thinking out loud with you, I don't have a policy paper on this, but if, uh, if there's a serious conversation about removing advertising from the CBC, maybe that should be pegged to a serious conversation about social media, uh, taxes on social media that direct the revenue right, back to the CBC and other public agencies. Right, I seem to remember from your book, uh, you had a proposal, I hope I pronounced this right, a tithing strategy, uh, which, has some similar contours so that these, I mean, you look at the market capitalization of a company like Facebook, and I, I think a reasonable person stands back and says, for a private entity to profit to such a great extent from the destruction of democracy, I mean, maybe there, yeah, so I, I, I see now the, uh, it's a little bit different from a tax uh, prescription, but uh, th this, this to me seems like something that uh, we might hope for before uh, our next federal election in Canada. Uh, we're nearing the end of the hour. Uh, I'm just going to check one more time that uh, there aren't any uh, questions coming. Did you see anything else that you wanted to address? Uh, we maybe have just a couple of minutes before Charlie comes back on. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good questions here. I think uh, there's a question about comparing to the UK. I say. Um, Country, countries that the countries where the the president or prime minister uh, can occasionally be a source of misinformation are always going to be worse off than uh, countries with a reasonably good um, competent prime minister and um, i'm sure there's a lot of diversity of opinion about how um, trudeau is doing i would say in an international and comparative context trudeau is doing just great <clears throat> right. On, on the whole, he's doing very well uh, compared to other major modern advanced democracies. Uh, well, that might mean that we're uh, that bigger a target for the troll armies uh, the next time there's an yeah. election here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with that, I think I'll try to virtually hand things back to Charlie, who's going to do uh, the wrap up and the uh, book raffle. So I'm not sure if there's something special I need to click. Oh, there we go. Well, um, first of all, I just want to, uh, before we begin the book raffle, thank uh, not only Phil for a wonderful presentation and Darren for an amazing job of moderating, but also the productive discussion that emerged out of these two great minds coming together. And also all of our participants who supplied questions. Um, I was reading through them and uh, they really stimulated more thought of mine about this topic. Um, so if you want to be able to do a deep dive into this uh, without putting out a pin, now is your chance. Uh, so we're going to randomly choose three people from the discussion group. And uh, Darren had a suggestion as to how we might do this. So Darren, do you want to uh, sort of supply the first points of data? Oh, sure. So. Uh... I, if it's okay with everybody, uh, I was going to just pick a random number between one and I see 101 attendees. Uh, will that will that be enough for us to give the first book away? If I give you a number between one and 101 that's randomly selected using Python. Uh, you're probably asking the wrong person. How do we correlate the number that gets chosen to the person? Uh, so I have an attendee list, and uh, oh, I see we have to count. by point of entry. Uh, yeah, I see it's we we only have an at attendee list that's alphabetized. So I might have to. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't think this uh, scheme through. <laughs> okay, so what we're I think what we're going to do is go back to our original proposition, which was that each of uh, Phil, Darren, and myself will choose uh, a, a a letter at random and then a number to correlate with that letter, if this is already getting too complicated for people, speaking of data crunching, and uh, that will translate into the uh, proper person. Uh, so for example, A2 would be the second person whose name begins with A. 
Uh, I'm not going to pick A or 2, just so that it doesn't look like I'm uh, already the fix was in. So I'm going to pick um, E3. So I'm hoping okay. someone can check the participant list and tell me who would qualify as E3. And I'll do L6. Oh, of course, if there aren't six people with an L. Then we go to, then we go to M whatever. I've already figured this part out. Great. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna use my random number selector from one to 26 to get my letter and it turned out to be H and I'm gonna do my uh, random number selector from one to 10 to get my number and that is six. So H six. Again, that could, could uh, bleed over to I or even J. So now I'm depending on the gremlins to tell me this is this is prolonging suspense in a way that we did not intend. <laughs> um, who are the lucky recipients? Uh, who would qualify as E3, H6, and L6? So we go to E, we count the third one down, yes. uh, and uh, I see uh, Elizabeth Ecker. And then I'm going to go to, uh, what was the second combination, please? It was H6. We'll go in alphabetical order. Great. So H6, uh, uh, the only H I see is Harold Brief. So do we just consider six to be one? If, yeah, if there's only one in the letter category, category I would say, uh, oh, I, th I think we should have gone over this before. So, uh, so. Well, I've already said a name, so I think I'm going to Yes, we to have Adam. to give it to Harold. You know what I like is that the draw is completely shambolic. The talk could not have been smoother and more professional, so why not have the, you know, it's wheels close to random. Bus as we're shambolic, giving up. close to random. <laughs> okay, and th I, this time, if you give me the third letter number combination, I promise to think very carefully before I answer. L6. L Unfortunately, Phil decided to go with a higher number. Okay. Okay. So I'm counting. Okay. So I see, uh, according to my calculations, the recipient of the third copy of Lie Machines is Linda Ozen. Spelled O Z I N. I N. Okay. And could you give me Harold's last name again? Brief. B R I E F. Okay. So Elizabeth Ecker, Linda Ozen. And Harold Reef are the recipients of the three books. Um, what you should do to get your book is to, once, now that you've heard this news, is to send an email to alumni.innis at utoronto.ca. And then magically, and in a, I would assume a process more straightforward than what you just observed, you will receive a book. So there you have it. Now, before we, uh, before we sign off, I want to do two things. The first is to let everyone know that we will have another virtual event. We're trying, uh, this is a new thing for us, and we've uh, aimed to do one per summer month. So uh, we've already had our June and July, and they've been wonderful. And we're going to try something a little bit different, which is our first film event. So we will be showing the documentary, Mr. Jane and Finch, on August 13th, with the screening to begin at 6 p.m. The film itself is 45 minutes long. Uh, that will be followed by a Q&A with the director, Gardi uh, Conte, and the um, writer, Alison Duke. And so I'm, uh, I think this will be a great event. It's a very timely documentary. And um, so please join us for that. And then I just want to reiterate my thanks uh, to both Darren and Phil for an incredibly stimulating conversation. Uh, we already got, as Phil said, a preview of this work when Phil presented uh, the presentation or the, did the presentation called Tomorrow's Leviathan. And now we've seen it come to its full fruition. And uh, a wonderful insight into how the political landscape is working in relation to various social media sites it is. So thanks again to both Darren and Phil. Thank you to our audience um, for joining us and hope to see, see you all again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.